issues. A number of those have already been put on the table in a forceful way. And we will try and use this session to stimulate thinking on where we are and where we are going in the field. So let's see the batting order, the top of mind agenda that we're trying to move towards. I'm going to provide some brief introductory remarks, reflections on the field, uh, where it's come from, where it is now, and where it's going. They're very much personal observations of somebody who's been in the business, I guess, since it all started. Uh, but I'm also only a jobbing assessor of no fixed institutional abode, so you can take the remarks for what they were, but I'll leave that to your good judgment. What's the purpose of this particular uh, slide? First of all, it indicates that SEA has multiple tracks to where it's going. The first Prague conference six years ago, a number of you were there, was whether we're heading in the right direction. And that was the, the big theme title that we took now. In the second uh, Prague conference, Prague 2, we now overstamp this to try and look at how to improve the performance and the power of SEA in terms of its traction on decision making and its ability to influence events. In some ways, a much higher clearance bar to attempt to realize in this conference. We'll try and unpack the performance aspect a little bit as we go through. My remarks will be fairly brief. They're mainly intended to try and set up a broad picture of the field for my more distinguished colleagues to uh, have at in full way. So, um, I try to capture here the five things that I think I ought to be saying about progress and prospects for SEA. The first is, there is much to celebrate. We heard a fair bit about that this morning in terms of the SEA Directive, which is the, 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 the fulcrum around much of which this um, conference has been organized to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the SEA Directive. There are also many reasons for concern. Many of those have already been put on the table as well in uh, a fairly trenchant way by this morning's uh, expert panel. What are the main milestones on the road of SEA development? And that road, in many ways, is a much longer one than I think is usually given credit to, particularly when we are uh, having a, a fairly European-centric view of things. In terms of the status of the field and where it is, I think it's time for a reality check on SEA practice, and particularly to ask the question, and that's what, again already been posed, uh, first of all by you this morning, taken up by others, but is, is it really making a difference? And if so, what kind of difference? What, what, what type of impact do we want SEA to have on the decision-making process? If our clearance bar is fairly low, and we're thinking of just the integration, if you will, of SEA into considerations, or, or the, the, the results of SEA into considerations of plans and programs, and indeed policies for those countries that, that have gone on to the next tier of approach, then I think we can tick that box and say, well, it's, it, it's done that. It's, it's I think, uh, one of the words this morning was on the map. If we're thinking of it in terms of really beginning to exert an impact on decision making, influencing the way decisions are made, what's coming out of the process, that's another matter. If we're thinking of it in terms of having a major impact on outcomes, what is actually being produced by the SEA that then, if you will, influences the plan or the program or the decision, whatever it is, and then that results in environmental benefits at the end of the pipeline as it were. That's another matter again entirely. So these are these are uh, quite different clearance bars, and I want to, to allude to those a bit further later on. My assessment, if I try to capture it in a, in a long liner, is that SEA is at crossroads, but it's also at crossroads in a world that is at a tipping point. Um, again, Yuri's slide this morning, which is uh, taken from the Nature magazine, showed those critical thresholds which are either being transgressed or pressed uh, at a global scale. And they give a very different dimension and reality to what it is we're trying to achieve if we really want the E to be in SEA as 
um, our colleague Lord Zimmerman pointed out this morning. So it's at a crossroads, the world is at a tipping point. In many ways, there's all, still all to play for in terms of the ability of SEA to exert an influence. But there's some huge downside risks if we don't get it right. Um, and I think those are the things that ought to engage our attention and focus our minds as well as we think about how SEA can be improved in terms of its performance and above all its ability to help deliver positive outcomes. Uh, what all this really leads to is in many ways that SEA potential as a sustainability instrument, much promoted, much talked about, basically is still unrealized potential in terms of its ability to actually affect real change in decision making and on the ground. To go back to the part that we're celebrating, the purpose of this slide really is just to say that while it's a very important achievement in terms of the SEA directive, much has gone before and then much has come after. The actual um, negotiation of the directive, its framing as, as a piece of EU law and indeed in its transposition in other countries. If we went back to the beginning, to the National Environmental Policy Act. In many ways, this has been a forgotten actor, I think, in the SEA drama. And it, it has had, through its programmatic environmental impact statement, horrible sort of American combination of acronyms, the PEACE, uh, they have been in the business of doing this since about, about 1972, 73, when they first began to roll out some of these programmatic assessments grouped into uh, things that either could be put together by geography and region, by technology, uh, etc. And, and they were the only game in town for, for some time. The, the next generation, as it were, was the group of, loose group of countries that started to produce standalone SEA systems as, as distinct in many cases from the EIA base around about the 19, 1990s. Um, and in many ways, they were the precursors of the the directive itself. That directive was the negotiation that was long in the making, uh, and, um, and it in itself was, uh, was quite a story that needs possibly to be unpacked a bit more. But um, the status of the directive, uh, probably better than many people thought it would be, and, and probably not quite accomplishing all that we would want it to be. But that's the nature of the negotiation process, and, and I guess the stuff of European governments. Since then, uh, we've had the UNECE SEA protocol, which um, uh, will also be addressed in more detail by one of the panel members. We have the Paris Declaration as it relates to uh, aid harmonization and the use of SEA. And there's been a spate of work under the implementer of the OECD DAC uh, since then on providing guidance, uh, advisory notes, regarding uh, new directions in SEA and the like. And most importantly, from 2005 onwards, we've had a number of developing countries signing on to this. Uh, Vietnam, China, uh, Indonesia, uh, between 2005, 2005 with China and Vietnam, 2009 with Indonesia, and a range of other developing countries, which, which is fairly critical for reasons I'm gonna to come to in a minute, because in many ways, this is where the battle for environment in terms of the global commons, I think will be won and lost. I just uh, here very quickly alluded to, to what these trends add up to in SEA practice. Limited use and adoption in the first 20 years, increasing take-up and diversification in the next 20. And the diversification aspect, I think, is important in terms of those of us who tend to think only of the EIA-derived process that is so visibly embodied. In the, in the European direction, directive. The, the directive itself, and to a degree backed by the protocol, have really not only been in legal milestones which has enshrined SEA uh, in supranationally and, and indeed in a multilateral sense through the protocol, but they've also in many ways standardized um, the SEA, particularly as it applies to plans and programs. Um, but what we've also had since Prague is new areas of emphasis and practice which are extending the, the process in new directions and, and new dimensions. We have a proliferation of approaches, uh, a family of tools 
Various names, typologies, linkages, uh, institutional brand names. Uh, some of the times there's different names for the same thing, uh, and in other cases there may be the same name for different things. It, it is quite confusing. I think one of the things that um, the um, redoubtable Rob Bohem may take up in his uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is coming up next and no doubt is eagerly awaited, is, is what plan are we actually on with regard to, to SEA and how it plays out. And, and the other thing is that the SEA literature itself has, has grown immensely. It's probably quite difficult, except for the, 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 the really people who are really interested in the field, to keep up with just what's coming out on, on the process and the practice all the time. And what we have is, is multiple lenses on theory and practice. And I think we got some sense of that this morning. We'll probably get a further sense of that in, in this, in this um, session. And in some cases, those lenses are, are, are quite different and at odds. In other cases, there's different nuances between them, and it, it's not entirely clear um, that people are, despite the argument, are not in violent uh, agreement about what the, the course of the field is and where it should be going. Uh, we also have out of this, which I think is, is one of the good news stories, an active professional community which is really engaged in trying to, um, if you will, not only promote the field, and perhaps over promote in some cases, but is, is really come, trying to come to grips with how to, to improve it and do it better. There's a bunch of perennial issues and new challenges that are, uh, and I can obviously broadly generalize it in all of these statements, but many of the long-standing issues that have been kicking around are still with us. Um, that the quality of, of SEA is, is often poor, considerations of alternatives can be weak, um, not uh, creatively used, the analysis of cumulative effects in my mind is still far too limited despite the much counter potential of SEA in this direction, and, and the public input in many ways can be, can be quite cursory. So what all these things add up to is that SEA I think is the effectiveness of the performance of SEA is, is compromised substantially in terms of its ability to actually deliver um, into policies, plans, and programs in terms of really uh, affecting major changes to how they're, um, uh, how they're implemented and the kind of content that they have, and whether they're really taking on board some of these environmental issues which are becoming ever more, more, more pressing. Um, my sense, again, it's probably a journalist view, is, is perhaps we do too much SEA. There may be too many inconsequential assessments you know, much ado about nothing, and not enough of them really do grab hold, as it were, uh, of the essentials in terms of issues that really matter for some of the big picture strategies and directions that, that tend to shape development often, uh, often without very much real environmental, um, systematic environmental scrutiny. And, and so the, and this is a question, uh, I mean, it, it, it's not something that's cut and dry, but, but I ask it, um, to you and perhaps to others in the panel and, and the audience to take off if you're so minded. And from this, I think, is, is it becoming overly bureaucratic? Is it becoming a pro forma procedure where we're, I think the words this morning are going through the motions. I think Ricky Ferrell's was, words were doing it by rote. Um, and my sense is there's a lot of that going on. And, and, and um, in some ways, this is the law of unintended consequences where a good thing can often um, lead to consequences that we, we haven't foreseen the whole, if you will, procedural nature of, of the directive. Um, question for debate, anyway. At the same time, and the, these are the parallel tracks, the sort of good news story is that SEA is also taking up any number of, of new challenges and, and, and new opportunities, um, mainly in response to the sustainability agenda, and not necessarily in the, perhaps in a penetrating and systematic way we would like, but added up across the piece. Um, this looks um, like a fairly impressive, if you will, burst of innovation. Where um, we, there's no sh uh, shortage of work, for example, um, and guidance on this. It's the implementation that becomes the issue. Work on the SEA uh, under the Biodiversity Convention. AI um, experts have been working on that for for some time. There's been guidance produced. Uh, this is a regular feature now of the various meetings of the parties. And, and, and that's sort of woven its way into the way they, they continue to do business. Whether it's woven its way into the way we actually do assessments with due regard to biodiversity, another matter again. 
use of SDA to address climate change. This is very much top of mind, top of the agenda. The um, two meetings of uh, IA on this especially at Aarhus and at uh, Washington DC. And I think Lona Kornoff is, is yes here and, and she'll be uh, the theme chair for that and was uh, instrumentally involved in, in the European end of the world. From that, the DAC has broadened it to look at the whole issue under climate change and uh, disaster risk reduction. How can we build processes which in fact manage and minimize risk and also try to build resilience, theme I'll briefly touch on in a minute. We've also got the consideration of eco ecosystem services now, beginning to work its way into SEA, in some cases using the framework for linear ecosystem assessment, in other cases um, just using uh, those um, ecosystem services as a way of framing and packaging results. Again, I don't think this has gone very far, and it's certainly not part of everyday practice, but it has some potential in terms of really getting some leverage, uh, environmental leverage on decision making. And now we've got the uh, preparation of, of the red initiatives. And I think Daniel Slungi is going to talk about this as, as well in, in his paper. Um, in many ways, the, the DAC has been quite instrumental, the OECD DAC has been quite instrumental in, in pushing some of these things. Um, I, wish the, um, I wish the member states of that SEA task team and others had been as, as uh, as um, robust in sort of taking them forward in a way that uh, actually leaves them into their development plans and projects. But maybe that's for the next decade, holding in mind that somebody was discussing how long does this actually take to work its way through. At the same time that all of this has been going on, the goalposts of SEA have shifted, in my mind, fast and fundamental. And we're, in many ways, I think, into a, a new economic order. The concern now is, is all about financial um, financial capital. Um, are we going to actually have sovereign defaults? Can the infamous pigs of the European Union actually continue to fly? Um, whatever the issue, um, whether there's a default or not, we're clearly in, a, in a, a, an era where most um, developed economies are very substantially in debt, uh, not able to do the things that they were in the past slowing economic growth. Um, I think Ricky mentioned that there, that might buy us some time with impacts, and well it might. But the, the, the other uh, double edge of that sword is it will get us a lot of push for deregulation and not having sufficient assessment, which is something that's going on uh, in my country at the moment in Canada in, in a fairly concerted fashion from industry who, to, to be frank, would like to um, pay lip service to this, but have done with the irksome uh, task of going through too much in the way of environmental assessment, <coughs> although they've also done an excellent job on one or two huge projects, I have to say. Th this new order of, of economic and environmental problems, the economic problems are one thing, the environmental issues are another. We really are pushing, I think, and in some cases have transgressed, if we take the nature diagram, a critical ecological thresholds that bone, I think, very clear for the future of development, uh, underlying development, and all the possibilities that, that go with it. Um, in terms of the limits of acceptable change and the difficulty of framing those, I wonder what this polar bear thinks uh, about them. It's a rhetorical question, it's an artifice and device. Um, probably uh, its limits of acceptable change are very different from those who are pressing for rapid oil and gas exploration in the Arctic Ocean. As the sea ice goes, so will the polar bear. And as the polar bear goes, so will much else in the Canadian Arctic. And, and indeed, the, the whole issue of climate change is now ever more closely intermeshed with biodiversity loss, as some of these ranges shift quite dramatically uh, in, in a climatic sense. And we've got the first example now of a genotype confirmation that we've got a new species. It's called a prisley. And it's a cross between the polar bear and the grizzly bear, as the, as the grizzly has extended its, its, its range significant mileage movements. So, so uh, and starts to cross breed uh, amongst bears. That, that may be a fairly rare phenomenon, it may not to lead to a whole new species of any magnitude, but it, it's a symptom uh, and symptomatic of a fundamental shift. So, um, any prescriptions? Uh, this is my very much my personal list. Um, I think regional ecosystem-based approaches show considerable promise, especially when they're linked to the kind of resilience thinking that um, 
the plus polling the people in this resilience alliance are, are talking about. That said, it's going to take a fair bit of work to bring that to ground in any practical sense. But I think the, the potential and the richness is there. Um, the big question to me is how can NCA move towards this fit for purpose, integrative approach to sustainability uh, analysis? My sense is if, if we are concerned to move in that direction, the first order of business is to reconfigure the process so that it um, provides a greater measure of what I would call ecological or environmental sustainability assurance. But what, they, what we're doing has a presumption for um, the environment, particularly where critical limits and thresholds are being transgressed. Um, where there's a looser um, possibility, we're using the polluter pays principle to compensate for natural capital that's, that's lost in full or, or in kind, if we can, from some innovative arrangements around that. Um, I'll, I'll ride this particular hobby horse in, in another uh, session, so I won't bother you with it now. The, the real plus 20, I think, has some real potential to give impetus to new directions for SEA. The green economy is the latest uh, buzzword that the UN has come up with, and provided we can try and make it work, and not just ring eco efficiencies out of the system at the margins, but we really need to think how we decouple production and consumption and how SEA can, can, can uh, take that on board, then um, I, I think that's, that's the direction we might think of. And the final one, and, and this is the, the, the biggest of all, the extent to which the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, South Africa, and the others emerging economies, which are now part of the, the G20, Indonesia, Vietnam, some of these other major um, economic growth areas, the extent that they sign on to the green economy, that will determine, I think, our collective environmental future. Because if China is running a standard economy at the rate it's presently consuming resources and pushing out residuals uh, and pollutants into the atmosphere, yeah. in my mind, and, and this is outrageous prediction, of course, and which I've got no real basis for making it, it's game over. So um, this is where I think SEA should have a maximum leverage. To have maximum le leverage, I think we've got to try and start from the common ground. And that's a neat segue into our next um, presentation, which is by the redoubtable Rob Verhain. He told me to pronounce it Verhain, because that's the accepted best way. I probably haven't done a very good job, Rob, but, but I am trying. Um, Rob is virtually needs no introduction, I don't think, to an SEA audience. He is certainly one of the, uh, nearly said there are no experts, but if there are any, he is certainly in the, the, the front rank as Deputy Chairman of the Netherlands Commission for Environmental Assessment. He's a man of many talents, uh, several suits, and I was going to tell you that he has an inexhaustible fund of jokes, but he probably, the other thing about Rob is expect the unexpected, but he probably will stop by not telling the joke this time. But um, <laughs> Rob is going to give us a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. Which planet is SEA on? Rob. I don't have to talk to EIA people, 
I don't have to talk about social impact assessment or cost benefit analysis or health impact assessment. It's only about strategic environmental assessment, which of course is an amazing event. I mean, this is the second time it happened ever. Uh, but it also is a great opportunity because it means that we can actually have amazingly efficient discussions. We can have effective conclusions because we all speak about the same thing. That is, if we all speak about the same thing. Which brings me to the question, are we all speaking about the same thing if we say the same? This is actually when Mirzi and I sat together in Mexico. We said, but what, what could we do during the plenary to help a little bit in, in creating a sort of level playing field of, of how can we sort of make sure that all of us have more or less the right thing in mind if we start talking to each other and discuss it. And that's what we decided to actually come up with a very short, very brief, very non-scientific Hitchhiker's Guide to SEO. Trying to answer the key question with this, are we all on the same as you? Right. What we did is we identified five key SEA evolutions. Not the evolutions that, that we uh, think are there per se, not the evolutions that we think where SEA should go, but simply if we take a helicopter view, if you look at our, what I think we have now like 20 years of experience together, what do we see? Where, where were we 10 years ago? Where are we now? What do you hear people discussing where it should go to? So we want to share this with you. And then I will conclude with two issues to keep in mind for the next uh, three days and one recommendation. And an answer to the question. Let's go to the first evolution. The first evolution is that if you look where SCA was like 20 years ago, and you see where it's now, you see a widening scope of application. This is actually the easiest one to see. All of you already know this, so I, and I make it anyway. Of course, 30, 40 years ago, we started with EIA for projects. But if you look where we are now, we have EIA for projects, we have SCA for planning program. If you go to conferences like this, you listen to people like, what is the new issue, where should we go in the future? Often what you hear is this. We should go to a situation where we have a whole package. An EA for projects, an SEA for plans and programs, and an SEA for policy. So this is evolution one. Now for those of you that don't really like words, but like pictures, it would look like this. <laughs> right? First we have assessment of projects, assessment of projects, policy plans, and then policies. There you are. Let's go to SEA evolution two. We also witness a widening purpose of SEA. Like 20 years ago, the key focus was really on information, getting the information base correct for, for politicians. So look, effective link, uh, to effectively link scientific knowledge with political decision making. But it was really about getting the information correct. And of course, very quickly all of us found out that if you have a great report full of great information, it doesn't change anything. It's just a book. It doesn't do stuff. It starts doing things, and that's where we now when we realize that an SCA should as much safeguard the information database as sufficient quality of dialogue within government, between government and the society. If we listen to people discussing where we should go from where we now in the next 20 years, what we witness is that people say, but we, we, we don't have sufficient influence yet. So yes, the information is great, we have wonderful public participation or stakeholder participation, but we don't link into the political process. We want to see political change. We have to start thinking as politicians. We need the political scientists aboard in order to get political change. So this is evolution number two. Let's go to three, oh sorry. And these are the pictures that makes it easier for you to remember it later on in my presentation. Three, why the focus of SEA? 20 years ago, the focus was really on environmental issues. If, if you look at SCA right now, we see that definitely it's hard to imagine any SCA that doesn't look at social orientation. So that's where we're at. But if we talk to people about where we should go, if we listen well, what we hear is that most people seem to think we have to go to a situation where an SCA looks at environment, social health, and economic issues, integral, sustainable development, if you want, and the institutional issues to uh, implement that sustainable change. So this is 
Evolution 3, a widening focus of SCA, and these are the pictures that go with it. Let's go to 4. We see an evolution from SCA as basically a standalone process to what should be, which is a fully integrated when SCA started off, and I don't say this is a generalization, right? So this is not true for all countries. But in the majority of countries, and especially in most developing countries in which I work, typically SCA starts as an SCA process, as something we do by itself, and at some point you link it into the planning procedure. If you look at where we are now, it is a common accepted wisdom that that's not the best way to do it. It should actually link much more closely to the planning process, be attuned to the planning process. So that's where we are now. But if you ask people where should we go in the next 20 years, typically what they say, full integration into planning, to the extent that maybe you don't even see an SCA process at all anymore. But it's there, its values and its, its tasks and steps are there. But this is yeah, perhaps where we should go to. And now I go to the last evolution, which is, by the way, the most difficult one to explain. Uh, maybe you and I are not yet sufficiently, we didn't have sufficient time in Mexico really. But this is something that I see happening in my country, and I think in some other countries too. With, sorry, these are the pictures from standalone to linked to integrated. The fact, the fifth one is the changing role of the legal SCA procedure. And I think it's good to, to look at that because we are also celebrating here 10 years of SCA direct. The SCA Directive is a legal procedure. Very important to have that. Of course, the procedure is not what you do in practice. What you do in practice is a process, much more sophisticated, that you build on that procedure. So we have SCA procedures in our country, we have an SCA procedure in Europe, and we use it. But the role of those legal procedures, I think, is changing. If you look back 20, 30 years, in many cases, people just took the SCA as the plan procedure. Maybe not so much in Europe, but if you go to developing countries, because often there are no clear plan procedures, they use the SCA procedures as a replacement of plan procedure. And it's, by the way, very beneficial in doing that. It's a lot better than having no plan procedure at all. If you look at where we are now, where most countries are now, we fully accept that SCA should not be the plan procedure. SCA is here to improve the plan procedure. The plan procedure the sexual procedure or water or energy or what have you is the most important one. And SEA adds to that, enriches that. But if you listen to conferences where we should go to, and if I look at what's happening in my country nowadays, I see something that you describe as SEA as a safety net for the plan procedure. For example, in the Netherlands, in many cases, we have now plan procedures whose quality is so good that actually what you could say is that that's beyond SCA. You know, everything is there. Environmental, social, integrated issues, institutional issues, it's all there. And that brings you to the question, maybe now we can get rid of SCA. Maybe we don't need it anymore. This is all hard. We have achieved rich capital. But they themselves, and political scientists, tell me, you know, Rob, it's great that they do it voluntarily, but maybe they don't, they don't always do it voluntarily. Let's keep SCA as a legal requirement, as a procedure, not so much as a planned procedure or to, to link into a plan, but as a safety net, just to give people credibility, trust that whatever happens, the minimum quality will be up to certain standards. So this is a, an evolution, and then these are the pictures. So now I've given you the five evolutions, and they look, in summary, like this. Phase one, phase two, phase three, you see from projects, project policy plans, to inclusion of policies. You see a focus on information, information and dialogue, to information, dialogue and institutional issues, political change. You see environment, environment, social health, environment, social health, institutional issues and economic issues. You see a standalone process, linking into the planning procedures, going to a fully integrated one. And you see SCA replacing the planning procedure to linking to the planning procedure to being a safety. So there you go, full picture. Now it comes, now I actually come to the only interesting part of my presentation. <laughs> which is the two issues that Yerzy and I would like you to keep in mind when you start talking and working together in the next two days. And then that's the common presentation. The first issue that I would like to keep in mind is 
Where are you here? If you think about SEA, what are the implicit values that you have in the back of your head of this is what I think is what good SEA is? And do you think that all of us are exactly in the same phases? Okay. By the way, you don't even have to be for the five evolutions in the same phase. You could, for example, have a system that includes policies, yet has a very strong focus on the environment, and not on the other stuff. You could. In some countries, I see that. For example, you can have, when a developing country starts, it's a very good idea to start SCA as a standalone procedure to learn how to do it. But at the same time, you see that it's an integral assessment and institutional issues are part of this. So you could have all sorts of combinations. But the interesting thing is, do we have the same picture as SCA? Maybe not. Just something to have to keep in mind. Just check with your opponent. If you say SCA, what do you expect me? And the interesting thing is we were all born and raised in our own context, in our own systems. If you ask me what SCA is, I will come up with something Dutchish. You know? Because that's what I think works. Yes, you might have. You may, you may think something else because in Austria or Greece or Mozambique or Latin America works differently. But maybe I don't know that. So we have a wonderful discussion that we go by that. So that's issue number one. Issue number two. It's on purpose that I call these evolutions. And there is an implicit normative element to that evolution. We all have the implicit normative value that it's much better to be a human being than it is to be a monkey than it is to be a millipede. Right? There is progress. If you go from one from the millipede to the monkey to the human being, there is progress. So most people, if they look at these evolutions, they will really look at them as evolutions, which is we start here, then we improve, then we improve, and this is where we end up. So this is the best thing. And if we go out to countries and explain to them what, what good SCA is and where they should go and how they should develop, we work from phase one to phase three. Is that correct? Probably not. Probably not. Because after all, the SCA system that delivers best its objectives in a specific context is the best SCA system. If you start in phase three in a country that is really a, in a specific context, you will feel miserable, or vice versa. So let's not be too normative about SCA. Let's keep in mind that we really have to look at context and then adapt the SCA system to that. It's not necessarily that phase three is better than two or two is better than one. And now I come to my final recommendation. Where is Europe? We are celebrating here 10 years of SCA. Well, in some countries like mine, 25, by the way. But uh, 10 is fine with me. Um, where are we? Are all the European countries at the same level of their development? Where is, where is the European directive? Would it be overall <coughs> phase two? Probably overall phase two. That brings us to the interesting question, is it time for a phase three directive? And I've listened uh, very well uh, to George when he said, yes, there will be a window of opportunity in 2016. So that means that we are in a hurry. Because that's only four years. So if there's a window of opportunity in 2016 for perhaps a phase three EU SEA directive, we have to stop working on that right now. Because four years is not very long. Okay. I'm changing a little bit the content of what you said, but <laughs> you understand what I mean, right? <laughs> okay, in summary, three issues we keep in mind. One, SEA may mean different things to different people. Two, the best SEA approach is the one that delivers the best in the critical context. Three, is it time to start developing phase three EU SEA directive? Which brings me to the end of my presentation, except that I haven't answered the question yet. Are we actually all on the same as you play? Now, I am a positive thinking person, absolutely, but we may be in different countries. Thank you. <laughs>